And then when you uh, uh, graduated or got your PhD, PhD um, what did you did you have a strategy plan then? Well, my plan at that time was I'll stay at a university and teach, and uh, that this is a place to get research grants, etc. From, and I will just start trying to build a research program in this area. Right, and how did that go? Well, not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I found I I like teaching a lot, and uh, and uh, so this was interesting to do. But it was part way through the second year, I think. Um, that we'd gotten acquainted around the university and uh, the way my wife and I had met and done a lot of our courting was in folk dance. We just both loved the folk dance. Okay. We had all kinds of, you know, Scandinavian, Scottish, German, Italian, French, all these things were very interesting. And uh, so we'd met a, another university couple at one of these. He was a, a professor. I was an acting assistant professor, and the assistant professor is at the lowest rung of the faculty. And then you graduate to be an associate professor, mm -hmm. and finally a full professor. So an acting assistant professor is actually the very lowest rung, see, in that thing. Wow. So that's where you start. And so I met, we met a couple where the husband was an associate professor of economics or something. And so one time they had a barbecue on Saturday for mutual friends when we were there, and most people had left and I was helping him clean up. And I remember he was scraping the grate where he'd done the barbecue, and uh, he said, well, see, by the way, Doug, what's your interest, research interest would be? So I started telling him about all this thing, mm. really excited me, and somebody's listening and stuff, and finally he put down his scraper and looked at me and he says, well, you do know, don't you, about how promotion is handled in universities? Now, believe it or not, I've never paid any attention to that. Uh, I'm not sure. He says mm. it's dominated by what they call peer review. And uh, what does that mean? Well, he says you have to you have to start publishing enough papers in the best journals that that's what gives you a big upstart starting up about getting promoted in the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he says. And, the only way to get into the best journals is by a peer review process of people that have been recognized that status in your your career domain. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the papers that are submitted and select those that will be published. And um, and he said, uh, and if you don't get papers published by that peer review, uh, then you're really out of luck. You have to have a lot of actual peer support in the university before you get around that. So he said, but I can tell you right now, and if you keep talking like you are, you'll be an acting assistant professor forever. And he said it, you know, he wasn't joking. And I just, and you know, I never, I just, some ways it just makes me embarrassed about how naive, naive I've, I've been, and probably still am. So. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Oh, but I believed him. Yes. And so I started looking for where will I go, and I, I thought, well, I don't want to move out of the Bay Area, and uh, I initially started living down by Palo Alto on the, on the peninsula. So um, there are several organizations down there, the Stanford University, and and there's oh Hewlett Packard was uh, much the biggest uh, star in the electronics area at that time mm -hmm. here, but there weren't much else you know, in this area. And um, so I interviewed at the Old Packard and boy, and within a week or so they gave me a job offer to come work in their research. And it was all that based upon my research and thesis and patents and such. See? Yeah. And that. And then How was it? Did you accept? Well I was bound all set for that and and driving home to Berkeley very excited and saying and I said, oops, wait a minute, I stopped after 10 miles or something and got a, a phone booth and called up the research head to say, uh, his name was Barney, and I said, Barney, um, <laughs> I should have asked you this before and I've just been taking it for granted that I'm counting totally upon getting involved with 
digital computers, and I've just assumed that you guys would get into it too soon. And he says, oh, no, Doug, not a chance. See, so, oops, well, I'm sorry, I have to embarrass him and apologize to him and said I can't accept the job. <laughs> <laughs> and I also just tried for a little bit to apply at Stanford and uh, Dean of Engineering wrote back and said, well, we appreciate your interest in our university. He says, however, he says, um, uh, we're a small university and we have to specialize in very special, important scientific domains, etc., mm -hmm. like this, and because we're small, we can't spread out. And since computers are only a surface activity, we don't contemplate ever having, you know, computer designer use as, as a courses. So, sorry. <laughs> what did you do then? And then I had heard about an outfit uh, called Stanford Research Institute that was not a part of Stanford, it just, its board of directors had been selected by Stanford or something that started, and that they actually were doing a research project to build a computer for the Bank of America. Mm. And so they were involved with it already. Oh, so I, I, I telephoned a, an acquaintance of mine who had been at Berkeley, he graduated, he got his PhD a few years before I did, and so he said he, he arranged me to get some interviews. So that, he's the first one I saw when I came that morning. And one of the first things he said was, um, have you talked to anybody else here yet? No, you're the first. He said, well, I've got some advice. He said, um, you know, you you got some notable patents, things that not probably no other graduate student that he knew of there had gotten patents or something in there. So just tell them about those things you've got like this and and uh, and see what they're doing that's interesting. And, and uh, he says, that, that'll that attract your attention and they'll undoubtedly hire you. He says, but don't tell them about this other stuff. He says, that sounds so crazy. Please, don't, you'll get hired this way and then you take your time about trying to find out what it is. So, okay, I'll believe you. Mm -hmm. and so I didn't tell him about the big ideas and just told him about this and I got hired. And, so and what was your job there? Oh, uh, helping on in some research projects that were already going. And mm -hmm. uh, I found a very interesting one early. And, and, and Helped a lot on that and got going and later got some strange strains that I liked and then then finally after two or three years started trying to go specifically after what I wanted. And how did that occur? Well, finally I I got a uh, I met a Air Force Office of Scientific Research it was a specialty arm sort of and the uh, man who was running the office to give grants just happened to sort of say, oh, well, that's really interesting. And he, he was giving out some pretty far, far out projects. Mm -hmm. Like one of his research projects was a man who was studying the way gnats tend to swarm. And what is it about the gnats, you know, personality or, or basic makeup or something about the nature? Why is it that they stay swarm? Let me do that. Oh. When I learned that they were giving research projects like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt somewhat embarrassed that they were also giving one to me. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's the one that... Uh, and when was that? What year was that? That was probably 1959, something like that. There's an airplane. I just saw this. Speech, on speech. Yeah, but that's what my girlfriend there is just catatonic about. I should not show you guys any of that, and none of that should get into the. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to ask you to read something of this and film it. We'll keep it a secret. Oh no, it. let's not. No. Let's not even do it. Once, once no. you're done with this, mm -hmm. no. you'll have a look and you'll see if it. Okay. No, no. For anyway, you're interrupting. It's almost your words. It's staggering. I talked to Dry, everything's fine. I talked to Richard, everything's fine. See you guys in a couple minutes. You only have about five, ten minutes to film, and then I'll change that. Okay. So, where was I? Um, the first funding. Oh. Yeah. What, what, yeah. what did you research then? 
Well, then, then because of experience in the prior several years of here and there talking to people about what I really wanted to do and uh, finding very strong reactions and like like one group who were into uh, information retrieval, which was a growing mm-hmm. study because computers could be potentially used for that. See? And uh, boy, this was a, a group in the four, four men that had listened to my talk got me outside and, and I realized they were really angry, <clears throat> just angry. And, uh, Why was that? They'd say, hey, look, you know, all you're talking about is information retrieval. And what the hell do you know, an engineer, about information retrieval? Mm-hmm. And I said, no, it isn't just information retrieval. Look, are you telling us we're professional information retrieval researchers? So don't tell us what it is or isn't. And and uh, I just tried to explain. Mm-hmm. Nothing I could say would. They just got angrier and angrier. Because here I was going around totally unqualified, giving mm-hmm. speeches on what they thought was their domain. And then some months later, I talked to a, another person I was explaining it to, a visitor, and uh, he he. He sort of started telling me quietly, without that much vehemence or something, that uh, you know, there's a, a new discipline that's growing up that's called cognitive psychology. And he says, that's, that's exactly what you're talking about. Well, no, it's... Hmm. He said, look, it is, and you'll get into a lot of trouble if you try to come up with this. Like that. And so, boy, a few instances like that. So yeah, that's just disc- discouraging, I'm sure. Right, and then, then I read a research report from a, a very well-known research outfit in Southern California called Rand Corporation, who specializes in interdisciplinary. And, and what the paper that was written by several of their executives was, uh, it was saying, "Hey, look, there's problems in, in multidisciplinary research projects that each discipline, people trained in that, have assimilated without." thinking about it, some kind of conceptual framework about how to view the world. And each is different. And so if you put them together to work on a common problem, they'll each approach it with his own conceptual framework. And that was before the day when uh, the idea, the name paradigm had come out. And uh, so what that would mean today is the paradigms are different. but. Uh, the conceptual framework topic was used, and I said, boy, that's my problem entirely. Said, they said, what you need to do first is is all together work on a, what we call a search phase, in mm-hmm. which we're trying to develop a common conceptual framework for this domain. Yeah. I said, that's what my problem is. I don't have to provide anybody with this conceptual framework. So that was my proposal to this mm-hmm. first study, and that and ended up taking me a year and a half or more to mm-hmm. do that. And that's what was published in 1962 as a report, and later rewritten and published in a book. And what what uh, what was it mainly about? You kind of it's, tried to create a framework. It's what called Augmenting the Human Intellect, called a conceptual framework. Yeah. And this is what I began to call it, because then I began to get into there, I, I was fully aware of how much used the word automation was becoming as computers and electronics began to come in. Mm-hmm. And uh, other people would say, we're going to automate the office. Yeah. And I'd say, no, there are many other things going to change besides just automating this one task. And uh, the only term I could think of finally was augment, mm-hmm. augmenting it. And so that conceptual framework led to the whole thing about, hey, Everybody, if you talk about capabilities, almost every capability you can name that's an important one to, to provide professionally or something, uh, was built on a number of other subordinate capabilities, which in turn were built on others. And it really turns out to be a whole infrastructure of capabilities. What do you mean by that? Well, um, suppose it's my capability to uh, be a manager of a group. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to be able to speak English in mm-hmm. the same kind of dialect, 
I have to have the vocabulary that goes with this job. I have to be able to get to work and back. So I have to be able to operate the locomotive, whatever it is like mm -hmm. that. I probably have to know how to elevate, come up and down in the elevator. I have to, uh, you know, know yeah. by the pros, I have to know this. I have to be able to uh, to learn the office procedures and everything. And I have to learn about interactive, the culture and such, so that I know how to discuss a problem without insulting people and so on. Mm -hmm. So you realize, oh, that's just all of these. Um, almost any one of them is also built on other subordinate capabilities. Yeah. So um, the idea that if you come in and you can make a great deal of difference in one particular capability in this infrastructure, the chances are that was going to make other capabilities which depended upon it would mm -hmm. now have something much stronger that they can build into theirs and they'll change. <coughs> That'll change yeah. and right on up the yeah. How does that re relate exactly to your crusade? Well, if what I was trying to, to do is change a great deal how collective groups of people mm -hmm. could come to develop an understanding of some complex problem, develop a plan for doing it, understand the resources they might be able to get together or be able to go gather the resources, mm -hmm. make an actual specific plan, they could apply it, you know, marshal the energies and the, re and the capabilities to do that, etc. So that's mm -hmm. what I was going to do, and that's a complex capability. So, so if, yeah. if I was going to want to do that, I had to think about it. And uh, and whereas later in the '60s, in the later '60s and early '70s, so much of the rest of the people interested in interactive use of computers, mm -hmm. <coughs> one whole set of them. <coughs> was focused on automating the office. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, the real user is the secretary, because of course no professional is going to be working interacting with the computer. Yeah. And I kept saying, no, there be so much change. Oh, you know, and they mm -hmm. said, it's got to be easy to learn for the secretary and so on. And yeah. so their whole orientation was that. And they all just pushed me right off the stage, so to speak. Yeah, and it was very. This, this was by the time we we gotten the support to build a system that really would be very far-reaching today. I think it's just switched off. Yep. Yep. Let me just change tapes. Is that Ooh. much verbiage? Yeah. That sounded like a lot of. Okay. Uh, Fale, we need to change the tape.